Hey, this episode of the Adventist Millennial Podcast is sponsored by The Haystack. The Haystack is a voice for young adults in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that produces articles, music reviews, videos, and more. What's the and more? Well, you'll have to go to their website to find out. Thehaystack.org. The Haystack. Life. Culture. Theology. TGIF, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, and hold on to your hats, because this is going to be a crazy time-traveling episode. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'll be a dumpster fire. Maybe it'll be, like, a stream-of-consciousness thing. Maybe it'll be the worst episode in the history of the world, or maybe it'll blow your mind. Um, that remains to be seen. What do you guys want to talk about today? Too bad. You don't get to have a say in what we're talking about today, because I'm just going to roll with something that I think is interesting, even if nobody else thinks it's interesting. I'm going to talk about uh, time travel and the implications of that, and then we're going to do some time travel, because me from the past is going to tell us, present time, you and me, an idea, and we'll all see what we think about it. Um, okay, so with that being said, I'll see you in the future. Okay, so you may be asking yourself, what does time travel have to do with religion? Um, and I would say, hi, welcome to this podcast. (laughs) If you don't know by now that this is just my excuse to say all of my weird thoughts into the ether, then I don't know what you're doing here. Um... But no, I wanted to talk about time travel, and it actually does have some an interesting tie-in, I think. Um, even though this is going to be highly theoretical, highly abstract, and highly uninformed on scientific aspects of what we're going to talk about, um, including physics, metaphys- uh, quantum physics, what are all- see, this is how badly educated I am, all the th- the things that have to do with theoretical time travel. So when I was cleaning my house, which now you all are aware how often I clean my house that I wrote this like six months ago and just now found it, um, I apparently I wrote it. I don't have any recollection of writing it, so maybe future me actually wrote it and not past me and came back to the present time and gave it to present me so that I would think it was past me who wrote it even though I didn't remember writing it um, because it was a pearl of wisdom from the future. So that's probably what's going to happen. Um <clears throat> But before we get to that, I wanted to kind of talk about uh, a couple of concepts in fiction of time travel and the implications for free will. Um, So first of all, if if you've ever read the book Dark Matter by Blake Couch, I think is the name of the author, Google it! Um, Basically, it's about this physicist who gets kidnapped... Um, and he figures out that he can time travel through this machine that future him helped build, and so then he goes on a quest to figure out why he had been kidnapped, and it's a whole thing. Usually, even though, even if something is just sci-fi, it ends up having a bunch of philosophical and moral implications because of the concepts. <laughs> of, uh, you know, Back to the Future, the space-time continuum, the ethical concepts of time traveling and all that kind of thing. So anyway, I won't give you the whole plot of the book because, frankly, I don't remember the whole plot of the book, but uh, one of the things that happened was he kept uh, going back in time or going to different times, timelines, to try to um, get back to his wife um, because as I said, he'd been kidnapped. And so, throughout the course of the book, he keeps jumping into different timelines and replicating himself, basically, to the point where tons and tons and tons of hymns were all trying to get to his wife and his son in the timeline that was their favorite. So, like, a whole bunch of him were fighting over um, his wife in the favorite timeline. Uh, And so that got me thinking, like, what are the implications for free will? Because uh, this is the whole concept of the multiverse, basically, where you have basically parallel universes where everyone, everything and everyone exists, but make different choices and do different things. Um, 
And so this is the dice episode of Community where they all roll the dice and <laughs> show different timelines of the apartment burning up and Troy coming back with the pizza. Uh, and then you also have like Futurama has an episode of, of with the box where the universe is in the box and then they have to go into all these different timelines. Um, and then at the end, uh, Professor Farnsworth from each world reaches into the box and they both <laughs> pull pull the other box and it goes like inside out and so they cut off the portal um that's one of my favorites you also have a whole bunch of time travel in the show fringe that was a fox show uh that's really interesting where you have multiples of the same characters living in different timelines and uh yeah oh and then recently i was watching this show called future man which probably don't watch it if you're an adventist because it's Unless you like, you know, super raunchy sci-fi that's very over-the-top, campy, and ridiculous. Um, but anyway, in this show, they time travel, um, but near... Okay, spoiler alert if you're planning to watch Future, Future Man. And near the end of the second season, um, they are trying to get somewhere, but they don't... But they can't run fast enough to get there. So they time jump a whole bunch of times where they run for 11 seconds and then they time travel back 11 seconds and then keep running so that they can get somewhere without really time having elapsed um and so in the process obviously they replicate themselves every time they jump 11 seconds so there's like tons of them's running at 11 second intervals um and then at the end of the season they go <laughs> The future people come and take them to prison for time crimes um, and ruining the space-time continuum. <laughs> and basically, like, the, the, all of these different versions of them went and wreaked havoc across time um, because they replicated themselves all, all. But anyway, okay, so these are all the depictions of time traveling that you have um, in fiction. Obviously not all of them, but some of the ones that stand out in my mind. And so, when I was reading this book, um, Dark Matter, the whole, the moral question is, like, which version of him deserves to live in the timeline? Because, because there isn't one, I mean, they all came from his timeline. He started replicating himself after he left that timeline. So, they're all him, but some of them are evil, and some of them have made, you know, they all have made different decisions. So I was thinking, like, that, the concept of the multiverse, the concept of parallel universes, all with different iterations of reality, completely removes your ability to have free will, because it just says that, it implies that w whatever you do is just one timeline, um, while all of the other timelines, you do something different. So no matter what choice you think you're making, you're not really making it. You're just living in your timeline. Um, and so, obviously, for Christians or for anyone who believes in free will, that's not a very nice concept um, because it takes away our individuality because, well, we're not individual. There's infinite versions of us doing living out our lives in infinite parallel universes. Um, so I was thinking about, I had been wondering, uh, recently, last week I was listening to, to the Space Trilogy, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, and I noticed, uh, a recurring theme from the Chronicles of Narnia, and it comes up in the Space Trilogy as well, that God, or Aslan, or Maleldil, who's God in the Space Trilogy, always kind of goes out of his way to make the point that we shouldn't wonder what would have happened about something. Um, or we should only be concerned about what has happened and what we are going to do moving forward. Um, the what ifs of, you know, alternate timelines shouldn't concern us. And I, and I wondered last week when I was listening to that book, why he always went out of his way to make this point. But, but maybe, that has something to do with it, where the concept of dwelling on what might have happened or conceptualizing another timeline, really all that does is remove your ability to make 
a choice to make a decision to exercise your free will because it even if in your own imagination you are focusing on what might have happened or what might have diverged had you made a different decision maybe that's a version at least abstractly of the multiverse and it removes your free will i don't know what do you think this is me spitballing okay so so now with all of those questions muddying your mind already and muddying mine uh we're going to move on to the future me or past me whoever it was that wrote this thing about free will that i don't remember writing so past me is pitching an idea to current present you and me and we're all going to see what we think about it and maybe it's absolute garbage i don't know um we're all going to assess it together and see what happens so this is regarding free will as well um i wrote down two positions one that we're completely free and autonomous and two that we're actually automated and ultimately we can't control our own actions so the summary of the first position is that human exceptionalism or the idea that we are a unique species humanity and we have the ability to reason we have the ability to conclude things and to control our thoughts and actions because we have that sentient um, ability to restrict our ability to to make our own decisions or to think freely is a violation of our exceptionalism because we're the only species that we know of that is able to do this okay the second position is um, that there are so many things that are out of our control influencing us in ways that we don't even realize. Um, and apparently from articles that I read and printed out but don't remember reading or printing out <laughs> about neuroscience and fine motor function and automated behavior and all that kind of thing, um, neuroscience has apparently shown us that most of our actions are actually automated. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't really make decisions. We think we are, but inevitably, we do what we do. And even if we think we're choosing, circumstances that are beyond our control has already dictated what we're going to do before we think we decide to do it. So, um, motor functions in action before our awareness catch up with us is a thing and you probably have noticed this before i mean we all know that moving our muscles and things are stimuli from our brain that happen kind of unconsciously um recognizing patterns can happen unconsciously like your brain does it before you become aware like for example peripheral vision like when you're driving your brain processes a lot of information and makes decisions based on that before your consciousness catches up to that but i was thinking there seems to be this kind of division or chasm between the reality of motor functions which is designed to take uh, processing burdens off of our conscious minds and to make our mo motor functions uh, automated there's a difference between that and more complex, abstract behavior like de conscious decision making. Um, like, for example, okay, if you guys remember, how long has it been? A year, a year and a half ago when the shooting happened in, in uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. If you recall the story, the, the school resource officer was there and armed, um, but he didn't go into the building. And it came out later afterwards that he and at least a couple other officers on campus were armed, but decided not to go in for some reason or another. And so everybody was saying at the time, like, uh, well, you can't know in a situation like that what you would do um, in a life and death situation when you would have to run into a building, whatever. You can't know what you would do. Um, so is there a distinction between, like, for example, fine motor function of me reaching out to pick up a cup that's kind of automated versus me trying to decide if I'm the school security guard and I go into this building, am I going to get shot or shoot or be shot? Um, <clears throat> that's a very big difference in, in our cognitive decision making. Okay. 
So Malcolm Gladwell in the book Blink talks a little bit about this kind of stuff, the implicit decision-making that we constantly do underneath our conscious mind. So scientists, he gave an example where scientists were looking at a statue, um, but they couldn't detect their way to a fake statue by analyzing it, by going uh, grain by grain and, and looking, uh, they couldn't discern uh, the false statue, but people with a lot of knowledge of art just took a look at it and knew in their gut that it was fake. So his argument is that there's so much um, information processing underneath our consciousness that we uh, can make decisions. Our gut, basically our gut is our brain processing information before we realize what's happening. So this is this is basically implicit knowledge versus explicit knowledge. So, for example, um, typing is an implicit knowledge. If you know how to type, you're not thinking what you're going to type and looking and finding each le letter and moving your finger to press it. You just start thinking what you're going to type and your fingers take care of the rest of that. That's implicit um, fine motor function. Also, we all, native English speakers have an implicit knowledge of grammar. Like if somebody came and grilled you on grammar rules, you probably wouldn't really be able to uh, articulate why the grammar is set up the way that it is, but you speak grammatically um, and you understand the all of the rules and exceptions that apply to English. Um, even if you don't understand necessarily and are able to articulate why that is. So, so you have this reality from neuroscience that so much of our existence is automated that we don't consciously decide. So it's not really a huge leap then to say, well, what if even our conscious decision making is kind of like that and we just don't realize that it's as automated as it is? That's kind of Sam Harris's argument. But, but then I was thinking like, Apparently, I was thinking, according to this piece of paper, I was thinking, uh, what if free will is actually both of those things? So, it, it's simply, free will is simply the correct way of utilizing the implicit learning that you have and using it for more complex, like, non-motor functions, more abstract functions. So, basically, what I mean is, what if in order to really take advantage or use your free will, you have to get significantly out in front of whatever your automated behaviors are. So, for example, um, let's say you're driving in a car and you are turning and you take the turn too sharp at too high a speed and you start crashing. Well, at that point, you can't really use your free will to say, well, I decide that I don't really want to crash. Well, so sorry, you're already crashing. Um, that's physics for you. Uh, uh, but in order to, to choose not to crash, you have to have the ability to foresee the potential crash and before it happens and take steps to avoid it. So you have to look at the curve and say, okay, I need to slow down to be able to take this curve without crashing. So, so imagining, imagining what's going to happen in the future and determining to do that thing um, gets us ready for the thing to happen or pre-automates it so that when it does happen, when you are standing outside of the school and you've made the decision beforehand that no matter what you're going to do your job and, and risk your life, um, that part is already automated and then it just happens. The more we practice things, like for example, um, you could even mentally practice basketball and then be able to apply that when you actually play basketball. Or mentally preparing uh, yourself before you have to get up and do some public speaking. You play out the scenario in your mind so that you're kind of automating it so that when you do it, it actually happens. So, like, what if this is why humans need, so badly need lists and goals and things like that, so that we can organize ourselves enough to get out in front of our automated behaviors so that we can actually choose what we're doing instead of just automatically doing it. Um, this is why we need to do morning devotion so that we can refocus on the thing that we want our life to be 
uh, aiming for. This is why we need structure. This is why getting in control of something is way harder than staying in control of something that's already controlled. So like, for example, when I was getting my motorcycle license, you learn um, that if you're trying to turn on a motorcycle, if you look where you're turning, you're going to lay down your bike. But if you look where you want to end up, then you'll end up there. So, so if you're turning right, you don't look at the ground to the right where you're turning, you look at where you want to be. So another example is like, if I'm at work, sitting there all day, this never happens, by the way. Never. This is just a purely hypothetical. If I'm sitting at my desk at work all day thinking about the ice cream that I have in my freezer and how it's going to be so yummy when I get home and eat the ice cream, there's no chance that I'm going to get home and not eat the ice cream because <laughs> it's already been programmed to happen. And this is another thing going back to C.S. Lewis. Okay, I already told you guys that he explores a lot of interesting philosophical ideas within the narrative frame work. One of the things that Ransom kind of works through in the book Paralandra is the idea that he knows what's going to happen not because he can see the future but because he knows that those decisions have already been made for something to happen. Um, and I'd have to go back and reread it or you could go read it <laughs> to see what, exactly what I'm talking about. But that when I heard that part of the story this is what I thought of this kind of idea of like uh, being organized enough and being self-controlled enough to make your decision well in advance before it happens so that when your automated behavior takes over, it will, what you want to happen will happen and you'll still be able to choose what you do even though you kind of mo- a lot of the time don't actually choose what you do. You just you just hear your alarm and your arm automatically hits the snooze button. You walk in the door after work intending to clean the house and you just fall down on the couch and watch TV like it's just you're automated. Um okay. So back to that was a rabbit trail. If I spend time every day thinking to myself and telling myself that I've made dis- the decision not to love my life unto the death, as it says in the Bible, um, that that in the grand scheme of things, I'm willing to die in order to protect other people. If I've made that decision before, it has to happen. If I'm the officer outside of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High, I'm going in because it's already set in motion. Whatever the cost is, I already made that decision before the moment of truth so, so all of this huge, long, rambling, abstract, science fiction-y, basically, rant to say that I came down to, to this thought, and I want to see what you think about it. What if surrendering to God, as we in Christianity like to talk about all the time, you have to surrender to God, you have to surrender your life to God. What if surrendering to God is really just looking out, being able to look out far enough ahead of your own human actions and making decisions and mentally practicing those through prayer and commitment. So, so the whole, I'm surrendering, surrendering my life to God is the decision making that will apply to future you. So that by the time future you gets to present you, you've already surrendered yourself to the action that you decided to make and it just automated happens. It just happens that when someone cuts you off, you don't flip them the bird and curse at them (laughs) because your automated action is to say, well, that guy's probably having a bad day. Is this the reason why it matters in the small things so that we can be faithful in the large things? Because those small things are us automating our behavior beforehand because of the way that our brains work. I don't know. That's a thought for you guys. Let me know what you think. Obviously, I have no conception of science. (laughs) It's just me throwing out ideas into the universe and seeing what sticks. Um, I'll be interested to know if that was anywhere near sensical and what you guys think about it. Uh, I think, I think past me was pretty, pretty, pretty insightful. Um, okay, at the end of this thing, I wrote down 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11, which says, 
His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us the very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So basically, guys, the takeaway here is get control of your life. Use your free will. Get out and ahead of it. I'm preaching to the choir here because I need to do this in my own life. Um, know what you're going to do before you do it. Decide what you're going to do before it happens so that you can let your amazing brain execute the things that you've told it to execute when in the moment your selfishness might take over and not let you do it. Okay, let me know what you guys think. Is this crazy, harebrained science fiction um, lunacy? Or did it make you think about something that might actually apply to your life? Uh, let me know what you think. Send me an email at adventistmillennial at gmail.com or message me on any social media at SDA Millennial and shoot your crazy philosophical sci-fi wacky ideas at me and we'll see where we get. All right, have a good weekend.